Truth in History with Charles A. Jennings. Welcome to Truth in History. Today I would like to talk about Isaiah's rebuke to a sinful nation and what Isaiah said to his nation of ancient Judah applies to our nation today. And it's beyond any shadow of a doubt that sins are repeated every generation, the same sins. Solomon said that there's nothing new under the sun. So if there's nothing new, there is no iniquity that's new, maybe modified, maybe expanded, maybe glorified, maybe legalized, but that sin, that iniquity, the abominations that the Israelites and the Judahites committed in their day, we are committing in our day. And when I say we, I mean the collective body of the people of the United States, the collective body of the people of Europe, because the people of Western Europe, that's where most of us came from. Most of the people that I'm talking to anyway, no doubt came from Western Europe. And we as Israelites, we as the Israel of God, we have been blessed. We have been given blessings galore. But we have squandered them. We have spit, so to speak, in the face of a holy God. But someday we shall reap the whirlwind. We shall reap the whirlwind because we have committed our way unto the devil, Satan, the opposer, and to the SOS people, the synagogue of Satan, and we've committed our way unto ourselves. In other words, we as fallen, depraved mankind, Adam kind, we have considered ourselves our own God. Starting in the book of Amos, chapter number nine. Now, the prophet Amos was speaking unto the northern house of Israel. Not the southern house, but the northern house. But the principle apl applied to both houses. In Amos chapter 9 and verse number 8, it said, Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom. Which kingdom was he talking about? He was talking about the kingdom of Israel, which God himself had established under Moses. Under Moses, it became a nation. And those people later became a kingdom under David. And he says, the eyes of the Lord are upon that sinful kingdom. In other words, the kingdom of his own people not some foreigners, but the kingdom of his own people. And then the, the next phrase, and I will destroy it from off the face of the earth. In other words, a kingdom, in this sense of the word, was the government, the political body, the ruling class. It was the social structure of the day. And everything that was involved, it was the economy. 
It was the trade and the relationship with other nations. The kingdom, the leadership, the body politic. He said, I'm going to destroy that thing. But he goes on to say, except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations like as corn is sifted in a sieve. Yet shall not the least grain fall upon the ground. In other words, he's going to destroy the nation, the kingdom, but he's going to save his people, Jacob. And he refers to them as the house of Jacob. The house referred to the people, like the house of Judah and the house of Israel. In other words, that referred to the people, but it did not refer to the governmental structure. So the Lord said, I'm going to destroy the sinful kingdom, his own kingdom that he established, but I will save the house of Jacob. I'm going to save my people. Let's go to the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 3, beginning with verse number 1. Now, this is a chapter that probably is not very seldom read or expounded on. But Isaiah was a prophet to the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. And he was a young man at this time. God had anointed him. And Isaiah had a twofold ministry to rebuke the people for their iniquity and also to announce the coming of the Redeemer. But in this chapter, he is denouncing the sins of the people. Verse 1, chapter 3. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, doth take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. Bread and water represented prosperity. And he said, I'm going to remove that from the city of Jerusalem and the land of Judah. You're going to come upon hard times. You enjoy your prosperity and your opulence now but I'm going to remove that stable that you depend upon, that you enjoy, that is bread and water. That's something that we all love. Our food, fresh water, something fresh to eat every day, three meals a day. We Americans are spoiled, just like the people of ancient Judah. Then he says in verse 2, the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the, the prudent or the wise and the ancient, the elderly, the captain of fifties, military men, honorable man, the counselors, the teachers, the cunning artist, the, the cunning men that were skilled in industry, making things, commerce, and the eloquent orator. And he's going to replace them 
with this. And I will give children to be their princes. The immature, the unlearned, the untrained, the unqualified, the inept. And babes shall rule over them. And the people shall be oppressed, every one by another. In other words, the classes that lived within Judah, turning against one another. And that is what has happened in our country of America. That's what has happened. And it's happening more and more. Different classes, whether they be racial classes, economic groups, political groups. Look at Washington, D.C. right now. They are in turmoil, fighting, fighting, fighting. So-called grown men cannot agree on justice on the principle of fairness. No, they can't do it. It says, and the people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the parent or the ancient. And that's not only the immediate mother and father. But look how multitudes of young people in this country have turned against our forefathers or the ancients because they're saying that all the writers of the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, all the founding documents, all those writers were slave owners, racist, imperialist. Do away with them. This crowd that's in the streets, burning, looting, turning over police cars, Total disrespect for law and order. They respect not their forefathers. Whether they be the, our, our national forefathers or your actual genealogical forefathers. They don't care. All they want now is lawlessness. They don't believe in equal opportunity under, under the law or treatment under the law. They want, they claim they want socialism, but they're stupid. They don't know what they're asking for. Read the stories of John Noble, an American that was arrested in Germany at the end of World War II and taken to the Soviet Union. Read the books by Alexander Solzhenitsyn and he'll tell you what the gulags were all about. You see, our young people have turned against our forefathers, the ancients. Even in the church world, you ask people about the Reformation. Now, what is that, they say? They have no idea what the Reformation is all about. They have forgotten the ancients. John Wycliffe, Johann Huss, Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, and many others. Even John Wesley, Martin Luther, they don't care. They don't have any respect for Reformation Day, October 31. 
they have a Halloween party. See, we have forgotten the ancients. The Lord told Israel, remember the pit from whence you were dug. Remember Abraham, your father, and Sarah, your mother. But the church world has totally forgotten about Abraham and Sarah and the covenant that God made with them. They've forgotten about it. People, you, you tell them about the Israel message. You tell somebody that's an Israelite that they are an Israelite. They have a great heritage. And they say, so what? What does that mean? Oh, that's heresy. Oh, that's just Armstrongism. They cast it off. They're trampling under foot the pearls of great price. Well, back to verse 5. And the people shall be oppressed, everyone by his neighbor, by another, everyone by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. Low people of low degree blaspheming the honorable. Some people may wonder why I mention this. But why are so many people in the streets, young people and even some older people, politicians, ministers, so-called, city councilmen, legislators, wanting to get rid of Southern Confederate monuments and wanted to get rid of the Confederate battle flag. And you may say, what does that have to do with anything? They are attacking that because that's what is the easiest thing to attack at the moment. They hate the stars and stripes as much as they hate the Confederate battle flag. But that Confederate battle flag, whether you live north, south, east, or west, and you may have been taught things about the, quote, Civil War, most likely taught wrong, that it was a war to free the slaves. It was a war about money. And it was a war that the, the, the Southerners fought against a tyrannical government. And that flag, that battle flag, represents the universal emblem or sign against tyranny. And if you study that war, maybe someday I'll go into it more, but you'll find out that the imperialistic spirit at, or march of imperialism of America started right there in 1861 when Mr. Lincoln was sworn into office. And he turns out to be the baby doll the poster boy of the Republican Party and of so-called conservatism today. So truth has become a lie, and a lie has been morphed into a, quote, truth. It says, when a man shall take hold of his brother of the house of his father, saying, Thou hast clothes, be thou our ruler, and let this ruin be under thy hand. In other words, when ruin comes, 
when destruction comes to the city of Judah, one man wants, or one class of people, they want somebody else to blame. You have clothing. You have riches. You have power. Let this ruin be under your hand. I want you to rule over us. You see, the Republicans blame the Democrats for bad economy. And then the Democrats blame the Republicans. It's the same principle that took place in ancient Judah. Nothing new under the sun. In that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be an healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. What does that mean? That means I'm not to blame. Don't blame me, says one party or one president. It was the other guy's fault. Verse 8. For Jerusalem is ruined, Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of His glory. The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. They display they're LGBTQ+. They display it before the world. They take it into the classroom. They take it into the state house. It's been in the White House. And old Biden, he displays the LGBT flag at the White House between two American flags. Their sin is as Sodom, homosexuality, lesbianism, and they hide it not. They try to force their agenda on everybody. Ancient Judah had that problem. We have that problem. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. But say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Clear enough. Verse 11. Woe unto the wicked. It shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hands shall be given him. As for my people, children are their oppressors. Women rule over them. What do you think of this women's empowerment movement? Women in industry. Women as CEOs, women as politicians, women as governors, women as this and that, climbing the ladder of success in this uh, American dream, or should I say American nightmare. Women rule over them. They're now generals in the military. And Biden wants to make sure that they have proper dress, even the ones that have transed. His concern is not whether we can defend ourselves, but he doesn't want to offend some transgender in the military. 
we've sunk to an all-time low. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err. Our leaders are causing us to err and destroy the way of thy paths. The Lord standeth up to plead and standeth to judge the people. Then it says the Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor is in your houses, the spoil of the poor. The princes thereof, the ancients thereof, will be judged. For they have eaten up the vineyard. That means the elite, the rich, have taxed the people. They're eating up their sustenance. They're eating up their livelihood. That's what it's all about. Tax the people more. The rich get richer. The spoil of the poor is in their houses. What mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord? Well, when we read verses like that, in order to understand what the writer is saying, you have to take sometimes line upon line and analyze it. Basically, there were 14 different classes of people that were judged in ancient Judah. They are the mighty man, the man of war, the judges, the prophets, the prudent, the educated, the, the ancients, the captain, the honorable men, counselors, cunning craftsmen, eloquent orators, children, babes, and the people. But as we go to Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 16, we see a very interesting list. And no doubt you have wondered, what do all these things mean? What do all these things mean? I want to read the list. It says, Moreover, the Lord said, Because the daughters, talking about the women, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go and making a tingling with their feet. Anybody with a half a brain in one eye will have to admit that a large portion, not all, thank God, a large portion of the women in this country are haughty and they walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, lustful eyes. And that stretch forth neck just means walking in a very sinful and prideful way. Now, I have to respect the mothers in Israel and the women and the ladies and the 
the mothers and the daughters and the sisters that are holy and godly, that dress right as becometh holy, and that are humble before the Lord, and submit, submit unto their godly head, whether it be their father or their husband. I commend you. I give you high respect and regard. But just go to the, your local post office or grocery store and see how so many women dress ungodly. They have no self-respect or dignity. And the women of Judah were the same way. They were proud. Look at the women on TV. All these bachelor shows. Nothing but flaunting their sexuality. These talk shows with these women whether they be secular talk shows or even some of the religious talk shows. Look how they dress. Look how they talk. How they flaunt themselves. Let's see what the women of ancient Judah wore. Verse 17, Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab, the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord would discover their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their feet. In other words, that day, going back to Isaiah chapter 3, and his time is that the Babylonians are going to come in and spoil the women's party. The Babylonians are going to come in and, and take over. There goes your tinkling feet. There goes your bracelets. There goes all the jewelry. He says, in that day, the Lord will take away the bravery or the haughtiness of their tinkling ornaments about their feet and their calls and their round tires like the moon. The chains, bracelets, mufflers, bonnets, ornaments of the legs, headbands and the tablets, the earrings, the rings, the nose jewels. Talking about nose jewels, isn't it repulsive? If you go into a restaurant and you sit down hoping to have a pleasant meal that the waiter or waitress comes out with a ring in their nose. That's enough to make a, a person get up and walk out. They were doing it back in Isaiah's day. And also, why are women these days getting so many tattoos? Even the little ones are ugly. But some women have them all over their arm, up around their neck, on their hands, some of them on their shoulders and backs. All these things that I'm reading from verse 18 down to 24 were, th were ornaments, jewelry, or things that came from the heathen nations of the East. Check out your history and see how some of the ancient women of the East dressed. Some of them still dress this way. 
verse 20. Bonnets, ornaments of the legs, headbands, the tablets, earrings, rings, nose jewels, the changeable suits of apparel, and the mantles, the wimples, the crisping pins, the glasses, fine linen, hoods, the veils, and it shall come to pass that instead of sweet smell, there shall be stink. Instead of all your haughtiness, instead of all your pretense of reveling, I'm going to turn it into a stink. And instead of a girdle, a rent. Instead of a well-set hair, baldness. Instead of a stomacher, a girding of sackcloth. In other words, instead of a girdle and burning instead of beauty. Now, some of these things we wonder, well, what are they? There were approximately 22 ornaments that were named in that list. Tinkling ornaments. Let me read you some of these definitions. Or anklets. Calls was a network of nets for the hair. Or head covering. Round tires like the moon. Crescent shaped ornaments like the new moon which were worn about the neck. Chains. They were pendants hanging from the hair, the ears, and the neck, used as dress streamers. Some women even had scent bottles hanging around their neck. In other words, perfume. Bracelets, armbands made of gold or woven. Mufflers, light face veils, so named because of their tremulous or fluttering motion when worn. Bonnets means the tiara or the headdress or turban, which was worn in the ancient East. The ornaments of the legs. Oriental women wore these attached to the ankle ring of each foot so as to compel them to take short, mincing steps. Headbands, tablets, which were houses of the soul or the breath, scent bottles, in other words, or boxes of perfume, earrings, a ring for the ear, a ring for the nose, signets, nose jewels. We see that today. Changeable suits of apparel, costly garments. Look at the amount of clothes that some women pride themselves in. They've got more clothes than they could wear out in a hundred years. Mantles or cloaks. Wimples, large cloth or veil, which could be thrown over the whole body. Crisping pins, ornamented purses or bags of gold, embroidery work. Glasses, which means mirrors. Linen, delicate, fine garments, hoods to wrap around, also around the, the head, veils, stomacher, a girdle. So we see all these things that the women of the East had. And what does it boil down to? It boils down to the people of 
Judah. The ancient people of Judah, just before the Babylonian captivity, the women were the prominent people in society. Where's the men that allowed the daughters of Zion to do this? They were the wimps. In other words, you sit down, you shut up and be quiet. The women are now taking over. And it turned out to be a society of opulence, pleasure, and reveling. That's what it says. Even in the book of Galatians, as I turn to Galatians chapter 5, it says in Galatians chapter 5, the works of the flesh in chapter number 5, verse 19, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, reveling. Reveling. What do you think Hollywood promotes? Look at the filth. Hollywood, or should I say the entertainment industry, of this country is like one big, filthy, vile boil that has been broken and the filth has flowed all across this country. Opulence, money, success, how can these game shows give away a car or $40,000, some of them a half a million dollars, and you've got tens of thousands of people homeless, starving, living on the streets? Something's wrong. Back to Isaiah chapter 3. Verse 25, thy men shall fall by the sword and thy mighty in the war. We had 58,000 in Vietnam. How many men, soldiers came back wounded physically or sick in the head from the Iraq war? Her gates shall lament and mourn, and she being desolate shall sit upon the ground. Chapter 4. And in that day seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. In that day... In the days of King Ahaz, there were wars that killed so many Judahites, warriors, that there were not enough men to go around for the number of marriageable women in Judah. That's what that means. Seven women taking hold of one man. Just, we'll provide for ourselves. We just need a covering. That's all. We just need to take your name. One other thing. In 2 Kings, chapter 23, we see something that is going on in our day. It's very obvious. It talks about the 
king of Egypt. And Pharaoh of that day, making demands of the king of Judah, Jehoiakim, threatening him. And what did Jehoiakim do? A weakling, a weak leader. Think about this when I read this verse. 2 Kings 23, 35. And Jehoiakim gave the silver and the gold to Pharaoh, but he taxed the land to give the money according to the commandment of Pharaoh. He exacted the silver and the gold of the people of the land, of everyone according to his taxation to give it unto Pharaoh. What are we doing today? Give away $40 billion because our leaders are concerned about the security of the border, but not our border. The Ukraine border. They taxed the people of that day. What do you think our government, our U.S. government is doing today? Tax the people. There's probably a hundred different types of taxes. And what do they do? They don't spend it on our border. They don't heal our people. They don't take care of the homeless here. No, they spend it in foreign aid, giving it away to nations that waste it. Some of those dictators over there in Africa are absolutely wealthy. They take American aid money, buy Rolls Royce, fix up their own private planes while the people are starving, searching for water out of a mud hole. But yet we just keep giving it away and giving it away. Weak leadership. Going back to Isaiah, it said, their leaders cause them to err. We are a sinful nation. Now in closing, I don't know what your future predictions are for the U.S. But I have concluded, and if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. If you disagree, that's fine. That God is going to judge this nation severely. And in the end, He will destroy our social structure he will destroy our government. He will destroy our economy, the body politic, but He will save His people, Jacob. I don't know what's going to happen to the rest of the people, but He says He will save His people, Jacob. Amos chapter 9. Isaiah warned the people of his day. And I did not write this book. I'm just a messenger. Reading the book, conveying the message. We need a revival, folks. We need a a revival, a true, genuine Holy Ghost revival, where we not just jump up and down like some of these charismatic churches and rattle the two brain cells in their head. 
We need to get back to the Word of God. We need a revival of the Word of God preached across America and expose the sin as the prophet was told by the Lord. Make Israel know her sin. Name them. So I pray that this message brings to light some of the sins of our day just like the sins of ancient Judah. We're repeating the iniquity of our forefathers. Lord, help us. Send a mighty wave of your glory to awaken your people, the house of Jacob, and remove the blinders from off the eyes of Israelites that they may see and remove the wax out of their ears that they may hear and the dullness out of their minds that they may understand that we are the physical family of Abraham and that we are the sons and daughters of Jacob. Lord Jesus, hear our cry. And I pray, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly, because you are our prophet, our priest, and our king. God bless everyone.